Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another webinar organized by us here at Euroclio. My name is Alice Modena, and I am Deputy Director and Professional Development Coordinator at Euroclio, the European Association of History Educators. And we are recording on May 24th, 2023. Uh, today, we are so happy to welcome our friends from the Zucker Foundation, who will host a workshop on the use of video testimonies in the classroom. This workshop takes place within the framework of the project Remembering Childhood in European War Times. And so before giving the floor to Andrea, I would like to share with you a few details about the project. The project focuses on giving a voice to children and women and to their experience during wartime in Europe. And we relate especially to experience of women and children during the Second World War and the early post-war period, although not exclusively. The project will run for another year and a half, more or less, and will deliver a wealth of items. The items delivered by the project include webinars, uh, as well as a guide for teachers on how to use digital exhibitions in the classroom, a digital exhibition, and workshops in Spain, in France, and in Italy. The project is coordinated by the National University of Distance Education in Madrid and sees partners in Spain, France, and Italy. You can see a full list of the partners on the project page and on the project website, and I have put the links in the comments. I would like now to give the floor to Andrea Soni. Uh, Andrea is the founder of the Zakhar Foundation for Social Remembrance in Hungary, as well as the head of the International Education Department at the USC Shoah Foundation. And we thought there was no better way to get started to talk about the experience of women and children during wartime, if not by giving them the floor and talk about video testimonies. Uh, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you, Alicia and Jody and Eurocleo for making this webinar happen and inviting me. And thank you all who joined us this afternoon to listen to ways how we can use video testimonies in the classroom. First of all, before I share my screen, I just want to say that I'm planning in this webinar today some interactive sessions. I created Jamboards as well, but please feel free to jump in anytime during the presentation or introduction. If you have questions, thoughts, ideas, let's try to really think together and work together this, this afternoon. So let's take it really informally and here we go please let me know if everything is visible yes okay cool we are going to talk about the use of video testimonies in the classroom obviously this afternoon before we start actually jumping in the uh, the testimonies and the personal stories themselves Alicia mentioned two organizations that I represent and here you can see some information of the two organizations. So let me just give a little framing of who I am or who we are. So I'm from Budapest, Hungary, sitting now here in the center of Budapest. And I run an NGO called Zahor Foundation for Social Remembrance, which was founded in 2007 and was developed to focus on personal experiences, personal stories, but in an educational way to help develop critical thinking by using personal uh, stories, not only stories of the past per se, but we are exploring how we can use these stories and connect them to the present as well. Maybe it will become a little more clearer as we move forward. Obviously, when we want to use the testimonies and these materials in the present, we can think about a number of topics. One or two are like countering prejudices or thinking about talking about identity, but most importantly, fostering inquiry in the students. We also want to present multi-perspectivity and show our students how they can explore things from multiple perspectives. We create educational materials, do PD, professional development and student programs, and work in international partnerships. So this is Zahor. The other organization, USC Shoah Foundation is an US-based organization. It is hosted at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. It was founded in 1994, initiated by Steven Spielberg. And many of you might recall that he directed the film Schindler's List in 1993, and he used a lot of personal stories and memories and testimonies and talked to a lot of survivors when he directed the film. After the film was done, he decided to initiate 
the collection of testimonies. So his aim was to get as much or as many testimonies of survivors and witnesses of the Holocaust collected as possible. This initiative has grown into an archive, the Visual History Archive, an archive of testimonies that now collects not only the testimonies of Holocaust survivors and witnesses, but also testimonies of survivors and witnesses of other genocides. We have about 55 plus thousand, almost 56,000 video testimonies. This is an enormous archive. We don't only collect these testimonies, but there is an aim, there's an objective. Our aim is to use these testimonies to remember these people, to remember the events, but to use the testimonies in research and education. And the USC Shoah Foundation is very famous from its innovative digital educational methods. And this is, or part of it, is something that I will show you today. So this is who I am or who we are. Uh, I don't have my colleagues here, but imaginary here. But now it would be great to know where you are from and why you are here. So I created a Jamboard and I will share the link in the chat. And if you can click on the link and just write on these notes where you're from, that would be mm, very helpful for the interaction. Okay, Netherlands. Netherlands, Spain, Athens, Belgium, Warsaw, France. Cool. Spain. Okay, we have quite a nice representation from Spain. Excellent. Okay. All right. The audience is quite extended, comes from a lot of places. The second question is really why you are here. So why are you here? What made you join us in, on this sunny or not so sunny afternoon? So there are people who work in projects using testimony to learn more how to help students understand how was life in the war. Okay, some people want to learn skills, interests, research, oral history. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope that everyone can learn something today and find the time spent here worthwhile. Before we really dive in, I would like to play you a very short clip. And I'm playing this clip uh, in order to maybe orientate you where we enter into the story. So we don't use testimony only to illustrate what happened in the past. Testimonies can be used for so much more. So here I brought a clip of George Papanek. Before I click on the clip, you see an instruction here. So note the most important thing for you in the clip. So here it goes. But I do think that there is something to be learned from these experiences. And the most important to me, I try to live that, I don't always succeed, is to take seriously what's happening now, that because the Nazis are gone doesn't mean that evil is gone in this world. And there are many forms, and where whoever you are and wherever you are, you can find it. And it's very important to be part of the world in which you live, to be, as the French ex existentialist would say, an homme engagé, engaged in, in, in the world and trying to do what is available to do that's useful. If you do that, you feel a lot better about yourself and you make a difference. The old saying of think globally, act locally is true. We all have opportunities to make a difference. And enough of us can create a critical mass so that the world can be a better place. There's no doubt about that in my mind. I think the effort is worth it, is wonderful to make, even though it's sometimes risky. And I hope that, I know that we will all continue to make this struggle and try to see that the world becomes better. That's what it's about. Okay, so this is what George 
said, George, uh, who is a Holocaust survivor. So what was the most important thing? If you have to pick one thing in this clip, what would that be? I would underline the idea of participating, making changes. This past and present connection, I guess that's one of the most important things that we underline when we teach history nowadays, no? And I guess he has summarized it quite well. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? What else can stand out for you in this clip? So when I first watched it, for me, really the word engagé, that caught my mind. And it's related to what you said about participating. Another thing maybe in this clip is to think globally, act locally. That's also something that we can just put in the back of our minds, how important it is. We cannot solve the problems of the whole world, but we can do things in our local surroundings or context. Okay, let's move on. And this is the mission of the USC Shoah Foundation, develop empathy, understanding, and respect through testimony. It's not a historical institution. We're not teaching history. We are using these stories to learn from them and develop certain skills. Yes, that's, I told you a little bit about the history. Steven Spielberg initiated the foundation. Since then, 1994, the interviews have not only been collected and put in the Visual History Archive, but they have been indexed to the minute. And now there is a searchable cataloged and indexed database, digital database, which is really unique in its kind. Uh, so what is this collection? Obviously, the bulk of the collection is the testimonies about the Holocaust, survivors, witnesses. I will have a separate slide detailing who we have testimonies with. But there are other collections, as you can see. The most recent is the Bosnian collection. The indexing of these testimonies is underway, but the archive already contains testimonies here. Very important collection, small but important collection that will grow is the contemporary anti-Semitism collection, where we asked in a number of countries, we interviewed people who witnessed anti-Semitism or was the victim of anti-Semitism or research anti-Semitism, teach against it or activists fighting against anti-Semitism. So it's a whole other different topic. But again, you see we have Armenian stories and Rwandan stories and Rohingya stories and so on. If you look at this chart, it gives you an overview of the testimonies by interview countries. So the interviewing process was global and testimonies were collected in many countries in the world. What is interesting is that you don't always have a matching number of the number of testimonies taken in a country and the number of testimonies taken in a language. The reason for this is because many of the testimonies were taken in immigration and the survivors or witnesses preferred to speak their mother tongue, even living in another country. So that's how the discrepancy works. On this slide, you can see a breakdown of the testimony collections. These are the types of collections that we have. What is interesting is to see in the Holocaust collection or World War II era, you have different people, interviews with different experiences, Jewish survivors, rescuers, Sinti and Roma liberators, and so on. The types of testimonies differ in terms of the experience group as well. This is what, if you want to peek in the archive, this is the interview page. So you see the testimony and then the right-hand side segments or minutes of the testimony, all indexed according to names or geographical names or indexing terms. Important to note, both for research and pedagogical purposes, that these testimonies, all of them, are full life histories. That's a very important point because we did not only ask the survivor or the witness to speak about the genocide, the traumatic event, but to speak about their life before even before, before, because we asked them to speak about family and grandparents and family heritage. So that pre-war life or pre-genocide life 
really encompasses school and family and locally relevant buildings and occasions and so on. Also interaction with the majority of society, living together. And then after the genocide, the inter continues up to the date or the day of the interview. So we learn a lot about post-war experiences. The testimonies were taken in the late 1990s, most of them. They really continue up to um, almost 2000. They consist of the parts that you can see there. An introduction. After an introduction, there is the full life history. Another important and interesting point is that at the end of the testimony, survivors and witnesses are asked or invited to share their photos from the family archives or documents or artifacts, whatever they want to, and speak about them. So this gives a tremendous treasure of family photographs shared and commented. Again, something that you can use in education perfectly. Sometimes family members also appear in the testimony. So that was also an option for the survivor to invite family members. Very interesting in this respect, and I'm just making a, a comment in brackets, how different it is in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. So Western Europe in the United States, testimonies that were taken there, the family kind of surrounds the survivor and shares the acknowledgement of sharing testimonies and so on. While in the other parts of the world, in Central Eastern Europe, testimonies don't usually have the family members or they don't speak if they appear. Uh, it's a whole interesting research of second generation and obviously partly caused by the other dictatorship following the Holocaust, the Second World War, and, and the silencing that the result is. In some testimonies, the survivors go back to, to certain locations, rarely to camps, sometimes to uh, like hiding places, and they introduce these places on the video. So that's also very interesting. Okay, any questions so far? Any thoughts and comments? You can also put those in the chat. Okay. So, I have a question just about the copyright status of the testimonies recorded and especially of the documents shared. Can they be used? You know that in Europe, especially, there is a big debate about copyright and about copywriting the material for educational use. And now we have a directive about the possibility to use material for educational purposes. Can these materials be used in the yes. classroom? Yes, and this can be used in the classroom, and I will slowly tend to show you how absolutely. Okay, as I mentioned, you can take parts of the testimonies that speak about life before the Holocaust or the genocide as they are life histories. I brought you another clip. Again, the question I posed here is how could you use this clip in education? So let me play this clip. This is a survivor who was born and raised in Hungary. She lived in the U.S. then. She speaks about her experiences or pre-war experiences. Try to think about how you could use this clip in ed education, if at all. I had a wonderful life. I had lots and lots of friends. And I was never asking anybody, are you Jewish, are you Christian? They were just friends. I knew I was a Jew, but my father, he didn't believe in religion. He was the one who ran away from his own bar mitzvah, <laughs> leaving a note for his father that it's too expensive and I'm growing up anyhow as a man. <laughs> and then he came back. And so my mother, on the other hand, at least, she put on the candles every Friday night. And so my father knew the only word to bench someone, bless. Yeah, that's it. And he would take my hand, he says, come, let mommy bench us. So every Friday night, we stood there with mommy, have the candles. But then Christmas was the big deal because my father felt that all his employees should come to our house because that's not a religious thing, it's a giving. And that's, he, we had a six foot Christmas tree and he would have the presents and the money for his employees there. So I grew up with the Christmas tree 
And even today, for me, a Christmas without a little tree doesn't mean religion. It's just beautiful. We had, as I said, lots of Christian friends, and there were a few of them aristocrats, and they would come to our house and play piano and gypsy music. And so I just grew up. I didn't know difference between people. Okay. Shall we try the jam board again? So how would you use this flip in education, if at all? Okay. You can also write topics. So what topics you would use this for or think of using it for? Spread hope. Okay. Discussion about Jewish identity. Very good. Very complex identity that she's describing. Okay, which French school children often ignore. I like that you're already connected to your location. Really great. Multiple identities. So identity is a winning topic here. Students to reflect on everyday life. Okay. Yes. Anyone else? Show the complexity of things. Yes, complexity. The things are not black and white. So again, you can see that we are not using the clips or not showing clips to show students what things were like as an illustration, but more in an interpretative way as an interpretation. To start a discussion on what happens today where conflicts arise. Okay. All right. So then let's move on to thank you so much for your contributions. And let's move on and summarize a little bit what, what you, we can learn from the testimonies. So these are stories of individuals, but they always speak about their families and their communities. So we can learn these stories. We can learn stories of local communities, families, individuals. We can also learn local history data. data that are information that you cannot get from anywhere else because there are people, these are the people who remember this information. Sometimes you get <clears throat> local history data, but not to the point of how people lived these events, lived through these events, what their thoughts were about the events, how they related to certain events. You can really nicely bring together macro history and micro histories. So these things can go parallel. I have a colleague who teaches about the Holocaust, giving the macro history in class and setting homework assignment based on a personal story for home. And then at the end of a week, they bring the two stories together. So as you nicely noticed, these are very complex sources. The really important point is what clip you choose to, to use in education. And you can choose and you should choose, I think, the complex sources, those that have deeper layers of meaning that can be unpacked, that can be interpreted, that, can, that help students develop critical thinking. We spoke of multiple perspectives and we'll speak about that as well. We also can use the testimonies or testimony clips to differentiate between various forms of information so students understand what is primary source, what is secondary source. There is not a big leap from here to the conscious media literacy education. So you can also use the testimonies for that. And we spoke about the deeper layers of meaning, how you can think, how you can look behind the stories, behind the events. Okay. All right. And now... I would like to do a kind of an experiment, and I need to know for that if there's anyone who speaks Hungarian. No. So please, if you speak Hungarian, put it in the chat. Because I'm going to play you a clip. The clip will be in Hungarian, so hopefully you won't understand it, understand the text. Okay. The reason why we are doing this kind of exercise is to explore how a clip can be used for developing media literacy, understanding, and so on. My question that I would like to pose you to think about what this clip can be about and what is the atmosphere of the clip? What's it like? Okay, so these are the two questions. Okay. 
And, and now you will listen to a very short clip in Hungarian. The survivor is Mr. Laszlo Kish, who was born in 1928. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. And he is from a small village in Hungary. And I'm not telling you anything about the clip. What do you think it is about? És egyszer csak elő lekezenek lőni, megszólalnak a, mikor már fönt voltunk az erdőbe, megszólalnak a fegyverek, utána gulyószórók is, a jenőek be az erdőbe el kell szaladni én utána, az ikért testvérem szaladt volna utána, de akkor már minden oldalról lőttek. Nekem nekem sikerült beszaladni a, a Schwarzenővel. Okay, so what do you think? You can write them on the jam board or just unmute yourself. Okay. Moving somewhere, going somewhere, and it's a bittersweet memory. Okay. He started with a nice moment on his life and then remember something bad. Excellent comments. Yes, so he speaks about people going somewhere. Or he talks about his family. The last time he saw someone from his family. Okay. Emotional, sad. And oh, someone said that as a happy memory or something, but an emotionally definitely important experience. Okay. Very emotional. So before we move on, I really I just want to say that this is not a clip that we use in education. This is a clip that we only use in teacher training. So we use it for teachers exactly because as you noticed, even without the understanding the text, it's very emotional. Someone wrote that he talks about his family the last time he saw someone in the family. So what do you think makes you think that? Oftentimes colleagues say that he speaks about the selection left and right. So what makes you think that. Mm -hmm. So this is something that proves that everyone who comes to whatever educational situation comes with some pre-existing knowledge. So obviously you are well versed in history, so you know that there were moments when someone saw someone the last time, or when people speak about the selection, then they know that there was something, the selection. So I just want to note that this is something we very heavily rely on, that people have pre-existing knowledge, and we always have to think about what is the knowledge that students, that people bring to the class. I really want to go move on to this emotional or the emotion piece. And so respectful, patient, loaded, emotional, very emotional. So two people wrote that there is something so that you use the word happy and I just want to, us to note this before we watch the clip with subtitles okay <clears throat> I have seen from the corner of my eyes that one of the participants Ishra unmuted themselves for a ah. moment so I don't know if it's because they wanted to share something uh, hi everyone I asked the question about saying goodbye to his family for the last time because I did wrote that comment okay and I come from Bosnia and I work with memorials and I have seen a lot of interviews with survivors of genocide in Bosnia and it's reminded me of the people because of the most emotional segments of their storytelling were connected to this last moment when they saw somebody from their families yeah that's all 
Thank you so much. This really reinforces what I've just said about pre-existing knowledge. So you come with the experience and the knowledge and information from Bosnia, from testimonies you have seen there. Okay, so let's look at this clip with subtitles. És egyszer csak elől elkezdenek lőni, megszólalnak a, mikor már fönt voltunk az erdőbe, megszólalnak a fegyverek, utána gulyószórók is a jenőek be az erdőbe el kell szaladni, én utána az ikért testvérem szaladt volna utánam, de akkor már minden oldalról lőttek. Nekem nekem sikerült beszaladni a, a, a Schwarzenbergvel. I just want to reinforce that this is a very difficult clip which we don't use with students, but it's important. It's an important kind of moment. So we join in Laszlo's testimony story. He's an Auschwitz survivor, and he speaks about the a period in January 1945, a few days before the liberation of the camp. They were, a group of inmates were herded on a forced march, and he was part of this forced march. So that's the context. Do we know what happened? Who has an idea of what happened? I would say forest walk turned into a shootout. Or yeah. actually not a shootout because only half of the people had weapons, but it turned into an execution. Yes, exactly. What else? What else happened? Someone typed in the chat, he lost his twin brother. So he lost his twin brother. That is he saying that his twin brother died. He's not saying, he's not saying that he died. What we understand from interpreting what he's saying and what he's not saying and his emotions and so on. Again, a video testimony or a testimony clip is a type of media that can be interpreted as a source, not only what is being said, but how it is being said and what is not being said. The silences are also interpretable. And that's, again, something that students can learn from. Yes, he lost his twin brother. Also, the way he expresses that, that I managed to run into the forest. And he didn't, he's not saying that, but he didn't. And it also implies not only the story, but this never ceasing survivor guilt that this event resulted in losing his, his twin brother. Let me just get back to the emotional part or the atmosphere part. And some of you, more than one of you said or wrote that there is something happy about it, but it's emotionally loaded. So why do you think, obviously the, this clip has two parts. And yes, the first part is, I also use the word happy and then something happens. Why do you think this is? And we don't know, again, we are interpreting something and reasoning about something that we don't know, but that might be true. I think it's because at the beginning, he's more remembering his twin brother when he was alive. Exactly. Exactly. So that's really great. Thank you. One reason or answer that I'm getting for this question is that he knows that something very emotional is coming and he's preparing himself. So he's trying to prepare and not to collapse. So that's one reason. But the other reason is something what you just said, that the, these survivors, when they speak about these traumatic experiences, they are, they're not just remembering, they are there in, in their memories. And if you consider this, that they are there in that story, it was still before, it was before anything could have happened. The brother was still alive. So he's remembering life 
at that part. And again, stepping back a little bit and taking an educational perspective, teaching nuances like that really helps students develop various skills and competencies. Again, not with this clip, but with other less difficult clips. Any questions about this exercise, about this clip, or anything that you would like to add or comment? You said that the students don't look at this testimony. And why is that? Obviously, there might be classes or students that are prepared to watch a very difficult clip like that. But our suggestion is usually not to traumatize students. And in most of the teachers, not to traumatize students too much. And most of the teachers, educators don't have a lot of time teaching this history. And they don't have a lot of time preparing their students. But we also say that you have to know your audience, your students. So you have to decide what clip or what material is appropriate for your students. But to put it very simply, in a non, not very much prepared class or well-prepared class, we don't want, we're not taking in a clip to make the students cry because that's not a pedagogical objective to make them cry. We want them to get close to the event and understand and unpack and empathize. We also don't want them to identify with a victim. We want them to empathize with victims because we cannot put them in the shoes of the victims. Again, if the group is prepared and ready and you think you can work with a clip like this, Yes, but this is very, to my experience, this is very strong or too strong. Is that an answer to your question? Yes, thank you very much. It's very interesting because we work in a memorial. We don't know the school children that are in front of us. And for example, we show the clip of Abraham Bomba in Shoah by Claude Nansman, which mm -hmm. could be described as very emotional too. And yet we show it to the students. So it's very interesting what you're saying, because it's a very good question about our educational practices, I think. Yes, you have to keep the balance. It's really hard to say that you must do it this way, must do it that way. We have to keep a balance to raise emotions and empathy, develop empathy, but don't overwhelm students because overwhelming students can alienate them. And that's not our purpose. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. This is a quote from Aina, a psychiatrist from Illinois University, Chicago. He's not speaking about the Holocaust testimonies or the Shoah Foundation testimonies, but test survivor testimonies in general. And it's really interesting what he's saying, what you can do. Survivor, survivors and receivers engage with some of the most critical political, existential, and moral questions that the society can ask concerning identity, other existence, values, and enemies. And these questions are at the core of how society and its people redefine themselves and the code by which they live. I really this quote, and you touched upon the identity question, for example, with Agnes Adachi. So there are several topics that testimony can raise. Okay, so now you have a, a kind of a, an understanding of the collection. So let's move into education, zoom on on how we use these testimonies in education and what happens. And this is maybe an answer to your question, Anitja, about use of testimonies. So the testimonies, as you can see, have been recorded. Then they were archived, indexed, and preserved in the Visual History Archive. And then I would pause before I get to the third kind of image here. So then you need to know that the Visual History Archive, the full 56,000, 55,000 testimonies, the archive is not available online. The archive is available at 186 access points across the globe. Most of these access points are universities, university libraries, or museums and memorials. And then the question came that we struggled with. I've been with the Shoah Foundation for kind of more than 15 years. And 15 years ago, we really struggled with this issue of educators wanting to use the testimonies in education. Survivors gave the testimonies in order to be used. 
and then yet they are not accessible. So what do we do about that? And this kind of tension that we want to protect the testimonies, but also want to make them somehow accessible for education, the eyewitness, the U.S. Yeshua Foundation's digital educational portal was constructed. This is a portal that is online and um, it's available for educators and students, and it contains a subset of the archive. So it does not contain the full 55,000 testimonies. Currently, it hosts 4,100 4, or something like that testimonies, which is still plenty, but that's available and accessible online. In a minute, we will explore eyewitness and all the possibilities that eyewitness can provide to educators. But before we do that, just to sum up from a pedagogical point of view, how we look at testimonies. So the interview is not an educational material. In order to make it an educational material, you have to create a pedagogical context, use it in a lesson plan, carefully designed around that testimony or testimony clip. We don't use full length testimonies in education because you cannot have a two and a half hours or three hour long testimony in education. However, I think it's really important that at least the educator watches the full testimony of the survivor and the clip of who's they are using so to understand the context. Another kind of principle, so let's put it this way, is that we use testimonies in an interpretative way rather than in an illustrative way. I also mentioned that we develop empathy and we don't ask questions like, so what would you have done? How, could, how can I know from 2023 sitting in my comfortable armchair what I would have done how can the students know that so that's not a question we ask because that's that that that's not gonna take us anywhere and again think about deeper layers of meaning testimony clips give you all three layers of learning so the cognitive learning effective and cognitive moral what where do I stand cognitive because there is always some information in the clip that you listened to about Laszlo Kish it's a very zoomed in moment but there is a cognitive information about a group of inmates that were taken to forced labor so this is new knowledge that the students can learn but that's very strong on the effective side. So there, it's very emotional. When we develop educational materials, we try to also look at the cognitive. So where, what, is, what do I have to do with that? Where do I stand? What do I do with that? And that is something that the pedagogical context can provide or support. And then on, the, on different terms, testimonies always can provide uh, knowledge, develop skills, and form attitudes. Okay, one more clip to go before we get to eyewitness, okay? And the question is very similar, but still it is a little different. Now, not how you would use the testimony. What do you think this clip develops, okay? What skills what it develops. This is a clip from Edith Frank, who speaks about the period right before Kristallnacht. Okay. When Kristallnacht came, for example, on the street, we were asked to line up. Actually, it was outside of the schoolyard. We were asked, the Jewish children were asked to line up and face to the left and face front and face to the right. And they were taking our pictures to show, I guess, our hideousness or whatever. And I was rebellious. And when he said to look straight forward, I stuck my tongue out. And the SS man came and with a stick. He really beat me up. And I came home all bloody and very upset. And that was really my first strong identity with the fact that I was Jewish and they were not. And they were now in charge. Okay, so what do, you, what do you think about that? So we have a lot of silence on the jam board now. Yeah, because this is a hard question. <laughs> it's a hard question, I know. Here, 
getting there. You're great. Okay, so let me put the question a different way. How do you think this clip is relevant to the students? And that's a different question now. How do you think? Is it relevant at all? And if so, how? I saw someone writing rebel or rebellious. So this is very important when we pick a clip that it should be somehow relevant or relatable for the students. Sticking their tongue out, that's something that everyone get. They get it that they don't want to behave, that something is unjust and that's how she reacted. So this is something that brings relevance to this clip. But my first question really was aimed at, I'm trying to rephrase. So when she says, she speaks about what happened, right? And then she speaks about how she went home and, and spoke about it. What are these two things? What happened is a fact, right? How she remembers it and how she explained is an opinion. I think it's a very important skill today to help students learn or to teach students to differentiate between, like they do with primary and secondary sources, to differentiate between what is a fact and what is an opinion. And because survivors always reflect on what they are saying, always, it's really easy to pick clips where you can develop this skill of how, again, you're not teaching only history uh, here, but you also teach how people remember history. First of all, you teach that people remember history. So history is not only in the books, but it happened to people actually. And these people, they lived this history and how they remember that. That you can teach about memory and so on. But in this clip particularly, you can teach about what is fact and what is opinion. And then again, short leap to fake news and media literacy and so on. Does that make sense? Again, summing up what we were talking about. First of all, testimonies help raise motivation and interest. And oftentimes when people don't see these testimonies, just learn about that. Sometimes I hear these are talking heads, it's boring and so on. It's not boring at all. It's not boring for students at all. It totally raises their interest and motivation. And that comes back from research as well. We spoke about empathy. We spoke about literacies, how you can help develop media and digital literacies, critical thinking skills. So it's really the question of how you look at the testimony, what you want to do with that rather than just show. We spoke, to, spoke about the difference between fact and opinion or interpretation, argument, reflection. So you can teach all these terms and or these notions using a testimony. We spoke about the relevance to the present, relevance to the student's life. For example, very often survivors speak about their birthdays. They speak about their 18th birthday. And then all of a sudden, it turns out that the 18th birthday was during the genocide, during the Holocaust. So it was not a happy moment. The 18th birthday is a happy moment for the students. So they can obviously see the differences immediately. So you can pick these points. They can help, the clips can help students recognize stereotypes and generalization misbeliefs. They can help recognize their own stereotypes as well and their own misunderstandings. Okay, so at this point, I would love to jump in and show you how you can actually get to this great material. So iWitness is the digital educational platform of the, of the USC Shaw Foundation. And rather than doing presentation only, I will open it on my computer. But first of all, I just want to say that this is an international platform used in almost 90 countries. There are currently this many testimonies, full testimonies in it, and there are over 200,000 users, student users. The use depends on 
the country, obviously. So there are countries with more users, but you can very easily get to eyewitness. In the center is always testimony. And the, the platform is in the intersection of history, education, literacy, development, educational standards or curricular standards. And I don't know how to put it more nicely because it's really getting into a kind of a common place to make, to create or develop active citizens. Yeah, so just to motivate students. So that's what eyewitness can do. As I said, testimony is in the center. It is built in pedagogical theories. It's built around the constructivist theory of learning. There are always learning outcomes in the exercises, the activities on eyewitness. And everything is localized because we have the local language testimonies, because we localize according to local educational standards, because of local historical events. We can localize it in many ways. Okay, and now I will open my, try to open my witness. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. So there are a number of things you can do on eyewitness even before registration that up here, there is a sign in button, but I'm not going to sign in yet. So even before registration, you can go on the watch page and click certain languages. And I don't know, there are fewer topics in certain languages. So in Italian, we only have one topic. In English, we have, and you can see the difference here. In English, we have this many topics. So you see the difference. So these are topically curated, pre-selected clips. And you see how many clips you have in that topic. So for example, there is a topic about choice and dilemma. You go there and you can watch the clip. Okay. What were the circumstances that led to your involvement? What you cannot do before the registration, you cannot download the clip and you cannot view the full testimony. You can view the clip though. In order to have these features available, you have to register. Registration is really simple and this is how it is. So you go on the sign in button, register here. Obviously, you are an educator, so you will click on this. And there are a couple of data you have to fill in, where you teach and so on, agree, submit, and you're in. The only thing I recommend you to remember is the password that you use. So yes, you can get in. So I am obviously registered. So I'm going to sign in now so I can show you the features. Okay, so I signed in and get to the main page. So the first function that I can show you is, you see the yellow button here, it's called search. So you go to the search button, which will take you to a page where you can see that there are a number of things you can search among on eyewitness. You can search among testimonies or curated clips or activities, or reference materials, or images. I'm going to show you now the testimony bit because that's the most in interesting. So you click on testimonies, and here all the testimonies in eyewitness will be listed. You can filter, maybe you want a female story just because Ramam Child is focusing on female stories. You can search among experience groups. So let's do a Jewish survivor at this point. You can filter for languages. And I'm um, putting myself in an unfortunate situation because I don't speak French, but I'm going to pick French. And uh, here you are. So you narrow your search by this. And then you say, okay, so I would like to listen to Fanny Baumer's testimony that's in French, a Jewish survivor. So you click on this. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So you, you can watch the full testimony. It is almost two hour long. But what is interesting is on the right hand side that the testimonies are indexed to the clips. So the second, each clip is really a minute and every minute has been indexed. Let's say you watch the testimony and you want to use in an educational material this clip so you can save it. And you also want to use this one so you can save that too. We will come back to this later. So what else can you see in this kind of testimony or mini archive function? You can see the biography of the interviewee. It's a short bio, so you can very quickly check if this is something that fits your curriculum or something that you would like to use. So certain like basic experiences and so on. You can also find the indexing terms in alphabetical order. And you can go to, ah, then this is what I'm interested in. So let's see what she's saying about that. E-L-M-A-S, qui nous a sauvé la vie parce que... You click on that clip and it takes you to the moment, to the minute in the testimony where the survivor speaks about that. You can also see the number of the list of people that appear in the testimony. And so these are the basic data. Then you can go to the watch page, which I showed you before. But here, after registration, you can see that one second that you can already download this clip. Okay, you can download it to your computer, or you can view the full testimony. I'm not going to click here, but if you click here, it will take you to the testimony of Norbert. You also have historical contextual materials that we call brief histories. This is mostly for non-history teachers or maybe even history teachers who are not so well versed in the um, subject. So it provides a quick history of the Armenian genocide. Let's say this is what it looks like. Okay, so a short summary. But the most important and interesting thing uh, here in Eyewitness is the activities. Activities, this is like a library. It's called actually an activity library. So as if you were walking among the shelves and looking at the backs of the books, these are all activities that you can click on and go into, which we will do in a minute. So the activities are in various languages. Again, you can filter for language and you can filter for activity type and other things. There are a number of activity types. I'm going to show you the lesson type of activity. And let's say it will be German. This is the only German lesson. And this is for really young people. It's for third graders. Obviously, it's not a Holocaust story per se. It's a downloadable activity. You click on that, you get to the activity page. You see the language, the time needed, the age group and the subject areas. And then you can download the lesson plan. So there is a short introduction about the learning games and the description and so on. And this is the lesson plan for the teacher. Okay, again, you can see, I will show this to you in the other activity that this is, this builds on the constructivist theory of learning as everything we do. We call it the four C's, the consider, collect, construct, and communicate. That's what we call, these are the German translations. If we go back, you have a student worksheet here and a testimony clip that you can use in the activity. If we go back, Another activity type, and that's a digital activity, is called MiniQuest. And we're going to use English here. And okay. And I thought we would show you this activity. It's called Education and Nazi Propaganda. It's actually is built to complement the film called Final Account that came out, a documentary that uses perpetrator testimonies, but it can be used in itself. And this is how an eyewitness activity is constructed. You see the four C's here. The section is highlighted where you are in. They so always have a primary source or a source on the 
left hand side and the text or question on the right hand side students can type in and teachers can view the answers in different part of eyewitness and that's how it's built up you can use as a source you can use photographs you can use testimony clips you can use posters you can use anything and uh, you collect information from clips for example and then you construct something. In this activity type, you always or often write an essay or, or something like that. Another activity type, and this is just for the sake of interest, Eyewitness has a built-in video editor and video activities can be used to ask students to develop a video essay. Rather than writing an essay, they can create a video essay. So again, the piece is the same. You have a source. It can also be a text and then some explanations, some questions that they can type in. And then they collect clips from the eyewitness archive. And in the construct section, they launch the video editor and they build the video, they build their essays. It looks difficult it's not difficult and it's really like you drag and drop the clips so it's really easy besides these and there is this thing final thing that I would like to show you we have global tab with global pages we have for example in Portuguese we have a kind of a collated sub page for the Portuguese content we also have partner pages. And this is what we were talking about with Alicia that we are hoping to create a European partner page. For example, the Wilson project is a global project that builds around the story of the kinder transport, but there is a lot more in it. And we have an international lag and resources about that. And you see how many languages, for example, in Italian, we have three activities around that topic. And then maybe the last bit that I would show in the program partner page is that we really want to try to be very responsive. And when the war broke out, we created a page called the Educational Responses to the War in Ukraine. It's in Ukrainian and English. And we have a lot of activities in Ukrainian, Hungarian, Polish, Czech, and English around resilience, around the history of the war, about uh, migration, a lot of material. If you speak any of these languages, check them out because they are really useful for Ukrainians having to migrate to other countries and refugees and also the local students welcoming the refugees. I think that's all I wanted to share today. I could talk about it for weeks. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead. There were a couple of questions in the chat, so I think we can use them to get started. One is from Irache, and she was asking who is developing the activity? Okay, great question. So first of all, there's an education team at the USC Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles. They develop some activities. Zahor as a primary partner in Europe. We mostly develop the Hungarian activities, but also mentor partners. So we work in partnership. That's really important. And we mentor partners to develop their own activities. There is a little handholding at the beginning, but it's like a relay race. So partners then take over and develop their, their own activities because we don't know what is needed. And when I spoke about localization, this is very true for eyewitness as well, because you, you have different needs. Sometimes educators also develop the activities. Thank you. And then the other question is from and certain types. This is an incredible archive. Among it, having the possibility of visiting people of different origins and different languages. Is there plans to have subtitles to the testimonies? And then he himself recognizes it's probably a huge task. 
Yes, the, the US Isho Foundation requires closed captioning for all the English content that goes on their website now. So everything that is in eyewitness has to be subtitled in English. And you can, so if you start working with the materials, you can subtitle that yourself. There is no plan exactly because what you said. So it's a huge undertaking to create subtitles because the indexing terms are in English. So if there is something that is of interest, but is in a different language, then we ask a local language speaker to sum it up. And then we create a specifically for that program subtitles. So it's user-based. Yes. Basically. Yes. I mean, it's a good start. Historiana is also user-based. If a Danish teacher wants an activity to be available in Danish, then we can work on the Danish translation specifically. There are Danish testimonies in Eyewitness, and we are actually working now with the Danish partners to develop the Eyewitness Danish, hopefully to be published at the end of the summer. So that can be something that can be broadened, and we welcome more people to join our team or come on board. Great. And then I see a question from Amaya. Amaya says, I saw some activities for primary and then she says, maybe the Williston project. And I would like to ask if you think testimonies are appropriate to work in primary and now we can work with them. And then she said, as you said before, some of them might be too hard for them and the topics are very difficult to teach. Yes, that's true. But exactly because they are life testimonies, there are parts that are very use usable for younger audiences, not necessarily about the Holocaust, but about Jewish culture, about identity, about living together, about family, about holiday, all kinds of things. But also, uh, if you check out the Wilson Project activities, then we use the Kinder Transport as an approachable story. And we also created an animated short video, six minutes, that puts the Kinder Transport refugee experience to the current context of a current refugee. And that's more digestible for younger children. So we cannot say that the testimony is good for this or not. It depends on which part of the testimony, what clip, and what's the educational context. That's key. And I saw that one of the activities that you showed was for K-12 and university, right? So you also have activities for bachelor students, for example. Yes, so the range is really wide. So there is a program, for example, called the Bioethics and the Holocaust, obviously for medical students, but history students, we have activities developed for history students or yeah, university students, social studies students as well. Yes, it depends. You can do anything with the testimonies if you have the right aim, so you know who the audience is, and that's how you develop the activity. It's not the testimony, it's the activity, the testimony-based activity. Please feel free to reach out. You are not born to know how to use these platforms. And it's really easy to learn and very helpful in our educational work. Students really like that. And it helps bring some kind of a difference to your teaching. Thank you so much, Andrea. I would just like to join Luisa, who is one of the coordinators of the Roman Child mm -hmm. Project. In thanking you so much for this session. It was a great way to get started in thinking, where do we get the memories of children and women during wartime? And I think that, yeah, using their own memories and their own words is a very impactful classroom activity. Yes, I would like to thank you, Andrea, to the Accor Foundation, to Euroclio or Euroclio team for this refreshing webinar with such interesting approach about teaching. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your interest. It was very invigorating. I really enjoyed being with you and thank you, Eurocleo, for making this happen and inviting me. Thank you so much.